Heads up guys, my name is The Cherno. Strap yourselves in, this is gonna be a long one. Today we're gonna to be talking about the Game Engine series. We're going to be talking about Hazel, where it's going, the future direction of this, because I've had the last few weeks to kind of reflect on what I'm doing with my life, what I'm doing with this series, and uh, this video is gonna be about where we're heading. Now it's very likely that this video will upset a few people. Uh, I'm sure that this will not fit the ideas that everyone had going into this series but hopefully the reasons I provide will reassure you that I'm not making this decision lightly and overall it's going to be for the best. And for those of you who are completely unaware of what's going on, I am making a game engine called Hazel and I'm also developing a video series called the Game Engine Series in which I show myself writing basically every single line of code that goes into making a game engine. And that is coincidentally also called Hazel, even though the game engine that I'm making along with a team is very different than the video series, the game engine series. So this particular video is gonna be structured in two parts, basically. There's going to be the explanation and the future, and then we're going to dive in and spend the majority of this video actually planning literally like the rest of the series and every single component from a high level that is going to go into this game engine series. And you'll see that I have nicely divided this video into chapters so that you can navigate it more easily. So to cut a long story short, Basically, the Game Engine series version of Hazel is becoming Hazel 2D. Yes, that means that we will not be adding any kind of 3D rendering, 3D physics, 3D anything really as part of this Game Engine series. My version of Hazel that I'm developing along with a team, that of course already is 3D and that's accessible by patrons. That will remain 3D and it will contain both 2D and 3D functionality as it currently does now, and we're gonna keep working on that. If you're suddenly oh so shocked, then stick around because I'm going to explain why I'm making these decisions and what the motivation is behind them. So first of all, when I say no 3D in Hazel 2D, in this Game Engine series version of Hazel, I'm not referring to the fact that it will not have any concept of 3D space. What I'm talking about is that it's not going to have a 3D renderer that will render meshes, 3D models, and it will not have like a 3D physics engine or anything like that. Currently at the moment, this game engine series version of Hazel that is on GitHub, that actually does support the concept of 3D space. Because of course you can create like an entity and it's got an X, Y, and a Z coordinate. It doesn't just have an X and a Y coordinate like you would see if it was truly 2D. It is in fact still in 3D space. We also have perspective projection and we have an editor camera that does in fact exist in 3D space and you can control it as if you are flying through 3D space. So all of that is in fact there, that will remain there, but we're not going to be officially at least taking it into more of like a 3D game engine sense. Basically, my idea is to take Hazel 2D, the game engine series version of Hazel. From now on, I'm going to call Hazel 2D, the game engine series version of Hazel. So just remember that. And if I say Hazel from now on, I'm specifically referring to like the full version of Hazel, the Patreon version of Hazel, my version of Hazel, not the game engine series. My goal with Hazel 2D is to make it an absolutely brilliant 2D game engine. That means that we will be focusing on implementing pretty much every system imaginable that you can think of that you would like to have in a 2D game engine. This series, after all, is called the game engine series, not the how to write a 3D renderer that is good by 2021 standards series. And it's just becoming far too apparent with the work that I've been doing on Hazel, the real Hazel, just how much time it would take to actually teach and record videos on every single line of code that goes into something like that. And the thing is, at the end of the day, not everyone is interested in 3D rendering. I think the Game Engine series is a bit misleading if 90% of it would be 3D rendering and then all the other systems fit in at some point then. Not to mention it's going to keep going for literally the rest of my life, which it looks like it probably will anyway. So my point is the scope is just far too large and I would rather focus on the engine in a more holistic approach rather than focusing on this kind of massive part of it. Now that being said, and I have mentioned this before, like the scope of the 2D rendering and the 2D games that we're making, you know, I'm not, I'm not picturing 80s Space Invaders or something like that. Over the last few weeks, I've been playing two games on my Nintendo Switch, Celeste and Hollow Knight. Now these are both 2D games, so to speak. For those of you who haven't played these games, by the way, I highly recommend them. They are both 
excellent. Now, Celeste on one hand is a little bit more simple in the way that it renders everything. Hollow Knight on the other hand is very much a, a great example of a 2D game in 3D space because the whole thing is made up of so many different layers. There's so much parallaxing going on. The art in that game is just, it's almost overwhelming for me to look at realizing how much work has gone into that. It's also a great example of combining 2D art with engine generated things such as like particle effects, lighting and other things. I think that Hollow Knight is absolutely a great benchmark, a great goal to work towards as to the kinds of 2D games I wanna be able to create with Hazel 2D. So let's talk about why this change is happening. I mean, I think that a lot of you probably can already guess that it's a lot of work to try and complete, complete quote unquote, a 3D game engine. I mean, first of all, if you look at other engines that are currently out there in the wild, they're not completed. I mean, I would call them completed in the sense that it, it really depends how you define that. Like what does completing a 3D game engine mean? Well, I guess to me, it means it's at a state where you can ship, like actually ship a complete game with it that includes all of the things we have grown accustomed to being in a game. So like, you know, if you don't support audio, but you have great graphics, I wouldn't really call that a complete game engine because usually games have sound. The other problem is that like the term 3D game engine, I mean, you could argue that what we have in Hazel 2D is a 3D game engine because it it is in 3D space. So like, it really depends if you kind of picture something really simple that's in 3D space, or you look at a 3D game such as I don't know, Call of Duty, or why is it so hard to come up with 3D games on the spot? Battlefield, Ratchet and Clank, just like 3D games, guys. My point being that 3D games in 2021 are pretty like complex in both the interaction with the world, but then also the actual rendering technology that goes into them. That's kind of what we're trying to do with Hazel, with the real Hazel. Like that's, that's hard enough as it is, but then to convert that into a video tutorial series is both, I think, mostly unhelpful for people who are actually trying to do this because I don't think they'd be sitting through videos like that unless it's for entertainment. Um, but also, there's just, just too much time has to go into that. I mean, to be blunt, there is just a lot, there's too much time to go into that time that I would rather spend actually making the game engine because as I mentioned, that's a difficult enough task as it is. The goal of the game engine series, as I mentioned, is to make a game engine and to bring it into that kind of production quality state. What I mean by that is to get it to the point where I would happily ship a 2D game with it on Steam. A lot has to happen in order to achieve this. A lot of mostly non-rendering related work, and we're going to discuss all of that here today. So that's the first reason, just the fact that the scope is absolutely enormous. The second reason is mostly because I don't necessarily consider myself a career academic. So first and foremost, I see myself as a software engineer. I see myself as someone working on Hazel, working on a game engine. I actually want to make the game engine and I want to make games with it. And I want to ship them and distribute them and let people play them like a piece of art. I'm an engineer making art. I mean, that's the entire goal of Hazel, to create a game engine that can make games. And not just an engine that I can use to make games, but an engine that, well, everyone can use to make games if they want, which, you know, that's debatable. The actual like step-by-step -step tutorial series aspect of, of Hazel that's secondary. I started the game engine series because I wanted to teach people how to make game engines, but I also wanted to make a game engine first and foremost. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that I don't consider the educational aspect of what I'm doing important or that I don't care about it. I definitely do, but first and foremost, there needs to be a game engine that I've made in order to teach how to make game engines and that is my primary goal. The other interesting factor with that is the fact that like, I mean, the amount of complexity that would go into a 3D game engine and just the level of nicheness. Like, I mean, this series is already pretty niche, but I mean, if you consider trying to teach someone how to, how to make a complex 3D renderer in the context of a 100 plus episode game engine series, like the, the amount of people I feel that will actually get to that point and will benefit from that is just 
it just gets smaller and smaller. And trying to do that on YouTube, like I definitely don't even think that YouTube is a good platform for that. This is just way too specific. That's why I mentioned in my recent Bloom video that I would be creating a general purpose 3D rendering course that won't be on YouTube and won't apply specifically to the Hazel code base. So those are kind of the two main reasons because I think the scope is just enormous and also because I want to spend more of my time actually making Hazel and seeing what that can lead to, what that can become, rather than focusing on a step-by-step -step video tutorial series, which probably isn't the best way to help people who are at that level anyway. At the moment, the Hazel team that works on proper Hazel, the Patreon version of Hazel, there's eight of us. Now these are mostly volunteers, although some are on payroll, but that should give you a bit of an idea as to the effort that goes into Hazel. It's definitely not just me. Patreon is what makes Hazel possible in the first place, not just Hazel, but Hazel 2D and the entire game engine series. And hopefully your support will contribute to converting some more of these volunteers to actually being on payroll so that we can achieve greater things. Lots of the technology from Hazel will make its way back to Hazel 2D because of course the entire engine is not all about rendering. So not everything we develop in Hazel is effectively closed source and only accessible by patrons who help support the project. <sighs> okay, so hopefully all of that makes sense. If you have any questions about any of this, please leave a comment below. I will we'll be happy to try and reply to as many of you as possible, but let's move on to the planning portion of this video and we will discuss how we're going to make Hazel 2D, the rest of it. Okay, so this morning I actually sat down and I wrote a list off the top of my head of every single game engine system that I could think of that we are going to be putting into Hazel 2D. It's right here in front of me. As I said, strap yourselves in. This is going to take a very long time. I'll try and be kind of quick. This is more of an overview. Uh, it's I'm not going to be too low level, too implementation detail-y. It's just going to be specifically all of like the overview of everything that's going to go into this. Okay, so let's begin with the renderer. Now, the renderer, which already exists to some extent, right? This renderer needs to be able to support 2D rendering. Now, what do we mean by 2D rendering? Well, first and foremost, by 2D rendering, I'm referring to the ability to basically render triangles or quads. I mean, most of the stuff that we render in 2D, if you consider it as being two-dimensional, we usually render it on a quad. Now, as I mentioned, Hollow Knight is kind of an inspiration for where this series is going. So I'm going to be using it as an example from time to time. This is just a random screenshot I pulled off of the internet. So if we look at this frame here, there are so many things going on, but the main gist of it is that everything that we see here is basically a quad with a texture applied to it. If you've been following along with the series, you'll obviously understand this. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but my point is that like pretty much everything that we see here really is a quad, right? I mean, I don't know to what extent the background is separated from everything else, but the other thing with Hollow Knight is that it is in fact made up of layers, right? So we have like this kind of main layer, which is useless me drawing in 2D, but um, we have this kind of foreground layer. There might be some other things in the foregrounds. Particles are definitely floating around literally everywhere. We have many background layers. If you look at this from top down instead of from like the side like this, then what you'll see is literally like layers like that, right? So it is in fact in 3D space. This is our Z kind of axis, right? Um, so that's what we're seeing over here. But again, everything is made up of these quads. And so when we uh, look at our renderer and we think about what a renderer needs to support in 2D, it is just overwhelmingly, it needs to be able to render textured quads. That's the most important thing. Now, currently we are batching these together kind of on demand dynamically every frame into a large vertex buffer. That is a pretty good way of doing it. There are some issues with that. We could look into using instance rendering. We could use, look into using like a geometry shader to generate quads, although that's becoming more and more old fashioned uh, as time goes on, maybe like the new mesh shader can be used for that. Uh, you know, gathering those vertices and compute potentially. Like there, there's a lot of different ways to think about rendering quads. But for now, we basically have this idea of a batch renderer. Um, and that is, that's going to get us like 90% of the way there basically. And I don't think we'll run into performance issues anytime soon. Now, that's all fine, being able to render this stuff, but what about being able to manage our textures a little bit better in the form of texture atlases, right? So a texture atlas or a sprite sheet, uh, we also, I think, have covered those kind of, 
Um, those are basically ways to uh, put more than one texture effectively into like a single texture file. Well, I mean, it's nothing to do with files really. When you create a texture on the GPU, instead of making it like 32 by 32, and then having like six of those, you can effectively put that uh, put all of those textures into a larger texture and then, you know, map them here. So a good example actually is for like font rendering, but of course you can use it for absolutely anything. And if you look at a game like Minecraft, that's a great example because people have a lot of exposure to like the texture packs in Minecraft and what they look like. That sprite sheet there is a great example of a texture atlas because our GPU can really usually only deal with 32 texture units or texture slots at once, meaning that if we want to render more than that amount of textures, we need to split up our draw calls, which interferes with our batch renderer. Anyway, this isn't really a rendering tutorial, but the idea is we need to have texture atlases. Now, this isn't just used for like sprites or 2D graphics. Um, another good example in 3D use is for shadow maps. If you have like a point light with many different shadow maps, like one for basically each each uh, each face of your kind of cube map, right? A very common technique is to pile those into a single texture. And in fact, you can combine multiple point lights that are in your scene and put all of their depth maps into like a single texture. That's also very common. So this is definitely not like tech that's only used for 2D stuff, but it's going to be very important for 2D rendering. Now, um, moving on, Animation, right? So 2D animation, of course. Um, usually that's done by having sprite sheets. So you create it in whatever software you want to create it in. You could even create an, an animation of something in like After Effects and export it as an image sequence if you want. Again, usually they are in fact combined into sprite sheets to kind of save on that, unless they're extremely high resolution. Um, it's also possible to use back at EA, I um, actually created like a sprite animation format that we used for our mobile engine, which was for, uh, you know, I guess higher quality kind of animations that sprite sheets would have been annoying to use for. And that worked by delta encoding between frames. So it's a little bit similar to like video codecs, although not that complex. And you basically had multiple frames of, of animation and there was various compression that happened on it. But the key thing was uh, only recording the pixels that have changed basically, and then having like keyframes like you would in a um, in like a video codec. So that's also an option. That's probably better if you have huge textures because that way you don't have to, um, you know, have, you can't have sprite sheets of 4K textures, but usually you wouldn't really, if it's that big, you really need to think of something else. Um, usually these animations are quite small, so they fit nicely into like a sprite sheet and everything's fine. So I don't think we'll do anything fancy like that. Uh, I think we'll be okay with sprite sheets for the most part for animation, but we obviously want tools for that. We'll get to like the editor portion of this a bit later as well. This is strictly like what the renderer needs to support. So yeah, animation. Um, the other thing is uh, basically ha the ability to have custom shaders and materials, right? So in 3D, we're obviously used to having a material for pretty much everything, for pretty much every object in our game. But for 2D, since most things are just textures on quads, we can kind of get away with not really, um, I guess, using uh, this whole wide variety of different materials and possibly even different shaders. However, you may still want to have custom shaders for things. So, so an example off the top of my head for a 2D game would be like in Celeste, um, you can go underwater and then everything's kind of wavy, you know, and I don't, I, I don't know how they did that, but I don't think it's, you know, they made like some kind of character animation of it being all wavy, right? I don't think that's, it's probably just a shader effect. Uh, so doing stuff like that, as an example, that's something that would more or less require like a custom shader or at least some other maybe built in engine material that would handle like a special case of rendering or something like that. Um, uh, I guess another example is even like, because remember you can have layers. And so if you have layers, like I'm just, I'm just, uh, picturing like, you know, frosted glass, if you had frosted glass and there was stuff behind it, which was obviously in the background, kind of like the depth was greater then you'd have the parallaxing effect, which means this will move with the camera. And so therefore you might want to blur like this, this might be like an additional pass that goes on top of things that would in fact blur this area. You know, so stuff like that, very kind of desirable if you get into the more advanced effects. Uh, so I definitely want to be able to support that. Now, finally, um, I hope I haven't missed anything major, but basically post-processing effects, so post-effects. So what I mean by that is basically things like bloom, things like color grading, 
uh, color grading. Uh, there's many more things that you might want. Um, but the point is, you know, those there's no reason why those have to not exist in 2D. They do exist in a lot of 2D games. And uh, I guess if you're making like a really nice polished sheet 2D game, I mean, you could even have like auto exposure for different rooms and stuff like that, HDR rendering, all of that stuff. We do that anyway. I think we're doing HDR rendering. It doesn't really matter. It's not, not a big change. But, um, you know, that kind of stuff is also really important if you are kind of shooting towards like a higher fidelity, uh, I guess, 2D game. So that's also necessary. That is pretty much where I see the renderer. And again, I think we've got the first two more or less implemented. So it's really more about like, you know, animation and then th this stuff, which custom shaders and post-processing can come later. Animation is pretty important. Um, we we'll probably focus that sometime soon. All right, that's the renderer. That's part one. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is scripting, because in my opinion, this is probably uh, one of the most important things um, in, in actually making a game. Now, first and foremost, actually, with all this stuff, I just want to mention that this is in no particular order. And this is not. This has nothing to do with the order that we're going to be progressing in. This is just everything that needs to be done, basically, right? And I will be organizing this into like a Trello board or some kind of online medium so that you can actually look at it and you can also track the progress of this over time. Um, and I will probably even start tying it to commits and to branches and stuff as that stuff goes in. So scripting. Now, um, scripting is a way for us to basically create and define all of the behavior for what our, what actually happens in our game during runtime, right? So um, there's a few different ways to do that. Um, the way that I've kind of chosen for Hazel is C Sharp, and there are a few reasons for that. So first of all, C Sharp is an extremely capable programming language. It's also very fast, right? Um, I mean, Visual Studio is written in C Sharp. Uh, Frostbite, like the Frostbite editor, Frosted, that is written in C Sharp and it uses the C++ engine. Uh, like C Sharp is, is a very capable programming language. Obviously, Unity uses C Sharp as well for scripting, but I'm just talking about the language overall. I think it's a really good language. I've had a lot of experience with it and I really like it. I think it's great. And this is my engine, so lol. Uh, however, there are, there are other languages you could consider. Um, the thing with Lua is that like Lua is also very popular in the games industry, less so these days. In the past, it used to be more. But the thing is, like I personally, like for something like Space Invaders or like, I don't know, Snake, small kind of arcade games, Lua is totally fine. But when you start thinking about a large game that maybe could be worked on by a team for like years, I just don't see myself using Lua for that. So because of that, we use um we use C sharp on in in real Hazel land, and I think that it's also going to be perfect to integrate obviously into Hazel two D because why wouldn't it be? Now um, visual scripting is also a possibility. Um, I won't talk about that now, um, but that's also obviously a system that can be used. It's not bad at all. A lot of people are afraid of that. I'm an engineer though, so it's hard for me to justify using a visual scripting system. I feel more comfortable with code. I feel like I can get more done. I like using the keyboard. Like it's it's just it's just fits me a little bit better. But the thing with C sharp and what actually constitutes behavior and how you define behavior in a game engine, like this stuff is mostly tied directly to the ECS, the entity component system. I'm not even going to be talking about like ECS stuff. We've already got that. And we're just going to build more and more components for, for basically everything we need as time goes on. It's not something that I think we need to really talk about. But the thing with C Sharp, again, is that really what you're doing for the most part is interacting with the ECS when you interact with the game engine, right? So what I mean by that is, I mean, think of a think of a C Sharp script, right? You would, uh, if, if you wanted to, you know, respond to the user input and then move an entity, you would retrieve the transform component of the entity uh, and you know, in the on update function, if input is key pressed, blah blah blah, then change that translation of the transform component, right? That's how you move stuff. Or maybe if you have physics, you'll apply a linear impulse to something. Again, you get the rigid body component and you apply the impulse. So a lot of this stuff. I mean, you also instantiate entities and prefabs, uh, delete entities, 
like that kind of stuff. So that's all ECS stuff, right? I mean, obviously you can have an entire meta game, an entire like program running as part of your C Sharp scripts that manages all these other systems. You could write a multi-threaded AI model or something like that that will uh, determine these things. Like there's a lot of like stuff that gets built on top of that. But at the end, when you're actually interfacing with the game engine, you are mostly not fully, but mostly concerned with the ECS. So that's the kind of stuff that needs to be able to be readily accessible by C Sharp. Now, um, the other thing is reflection. So we want to be able to uh, basically um, look at the C sharp code, right? Have our engine read the C sharp code or whatever system, whatever runtime we're using, the compiled C sharp code, and see what has been exposed to the editor. So what I'm talking about is basically if we define a public float, or I don't know, you don't have to do it this way. You can have a special attribute for it called like speed. Um, or whatever, right? That's awful. Uh, then what I would expect to happen there is that whatever entity that script is attached to in like the editor properties for that script, you'd see, oh, look, here's a speed variable and it's modifiable uh, over here, right? So the idea behind that is, I mean, for the longest time, obviously, there's been a lot of different disciplines that go into making games, right? You have engineers, but then you also have artists, designers, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, C Sharp, I would argue, is pretty simple. It's not C++, right? That's why we don't really want to write our code natively, not just because it becomes less about data, like it's not like a separate module we can load, and it's not like part of the game assets the same way if it's actually native code. Although, of course, it could be if it's like a DLL. But anyway, we're not going to get into that. The point is that... C Sharp is pretty accessible by most people. It's not that difficult to learn, I think, at least in a scripting sense. Of course, language can be complex, but if you use what's required for scripting, I don't think it's that difficult. Um, however, providing tools for artists and designers to be able to easily manipulate things, like again, if you have this complex script, uh, but then you expose certain parameters that could be used by artists or by designers very easily, of course, it's easier for them to click an entity and then modify something like this. I mean, it's even easier for engineers, let's be honest. But like the point is, this stuff is really important because without it, like it would be way harder to be able to edit things. I mean, back in the day, again, if you, you had to get an engineer for everything if you didn't know how to write code, right? Um, it's not like you're going to be in C++ or C land dealing with memory allocations and like pointers and references and all of that stuff. So uh, a reflection system is very important. Um, and it also means that these values can be serialized, right? And they can be part of your kind of editor data or your scene entity data, whatever. Um, means that if, if you want to change the speed from five to six, you don't need to recompile the entire C sharp DLL if you're on Windows. Uh, you can just change the data that gets sent to that variable at runtime. So it's pretty powerful and it's definitely very um, useful. Um, you know, stuff like being able to like manage the life cycle of the C Sharp runtime. So being able to unload and reload assemblies. So in Hazel, uh, in proper Hazel, when you hit play, it will reload the DLL usually unless you disable that option. So if you're kind of compiling, you can compile in Visual Studio. Uh, then you can just hit play and it will load the latest script on demand. And you can see it's, it's pretty quick. If you've seen devlogs, it doesn't really take any time at all. So it's, it's, it is rather fast, but being able to kind of, I'll just say loading, which again might not make um, that much sense, but just know that I'm talking about specifically managing that life cycle. Loading life. Um, and then finally, uh, as I mentioned, like some kind of visual scripting potentially could be on the tables. That's a really big stretch goal. Um, so let's move on from scripting. Now, the next thing we have is physics. Who doesn't love physics? So this is also where the 2D nature comes in, because basically for physics, uh, as you can imagine, we're not going to be using like NVIDIA PhysX or any kind of 3D physics engine. We're going to use something called Box2D, which I have mentioned in the past. This is a pretty good 2D physics engine. Now, 2D physics engines in general are not the hardest things in the world to write. Uh, like, it's actually quite interesting if you delve into like the mathematics behind the physics. Um, and you'll probably see like physics engines are always scary to people. I don't think they're the scariest things in the world uh, unless you know nothing about physics or anything. Um, but uh, obviously using a library like Box2D I think is much 
uh, is a much smarter play. I'm not going to pretend to know how to write an excellent physics library. So um, that's basically what we'll be uh, kind of using. And so that will be able to fulfill pretty much all of our physics needs. Now, by physics, I'm also referring to collision, right? So just being able to detect collision even. So that's something that Box2D can obviously provide us. Um, it needs to be integrated with scripting, meaning like not only can I like retrieve like and, and with the ECS. So not only can I like retrieve a rigid body component, apply an impulse to it, and it will actually shoot like the physics entity somewhere, right? Uh, not only that, but I also need to be able to actually like receive callbacks when entities or triggers have like collided, right? So if there is a collision, maybe a particular entity wants to know about it. So callbacks as well, um, I guess I'll write that down, but that's important. Um, so that's the, that's kind of that part of it. Uh, we might also potentially have physics materials. It's been a while, like Box2D also exists in proper hazel. So we have both 3D and 3D physics and video physics is what we use for 3D physics. I don't remember if we support like physics materials for box 2D, um, but we obviously want parameters to go on to certain entities that are like physics bodies. So uh, restitution, you know, bounciness, like stuff like that, like how, how much something weighs, like the mass, uh, that also needs to be defined somehow. So that's kind of editor, I guess, ECS uh, integration. Um, and then, you know, joints, constraints, all of that kind of stuff. Basically everything the Box2D supports, we want to be able to expose and, uh, and have people um, kind of uh, manipulate those parameters to achieve whatever physics stuff they're trying to achieve. So next up, um, we have a particle system. And also like gravity, you know, maybe you want to make a game in space and you want stuff to float. Uh, but again, that's a, that's just that's just a way of exposing kind of box 2D parameters into Hazel. So particle systems. Oh man. Okay. So 2D particle systems again, slightly easier than 3D particle systems. But uh, you know, the main thing here is probably having some kind of like VFX graph. So this is a node-based editor, um, which we can use to define the flow of particles and, uh, you know, what maybe triggers them, how they react to things. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be like a node-based system. It can just be a set of parameters, but then you lose a bit of like, you lose a dimension basically, like the whole over time thing. But maybe even having, if you feel really exciting, you could have curve editors. So you could have like color over time and you could draw that, um, you know, there's, there's so much stuff to do with, like there is so much stuff you could do with particles, uh, but you know, being able to support textures, animations, all of that kind of uh, stuff that you would expect to have there. Um, animations, you know, you could maybe attach lights or things to them, which would affect certain shaders, uh, you know, being able to collide with things. Um, so usually collision is done, uh, I guess, separately to like the physics system, uh, although it can depend. And then finally, you can move on to compute. So if you're really cool, you can um, move a lot of your particle kind of simulation uh, code onto the GPU and do it kind of asynchronously on the in like in the compute queue in compute shaders, which is usually pretty nice. But anyway, um, so a particle system, again, very important. If we go back to Hollow Knight, these things floating around here, they float, they're not static. They are all particles, right? So it can do a lot to um, kind of uh, increase the fidelity of a game, I guess. It's not necessarily something that you just need for explosions or like rocket launches or smoke. Um, just having particles floating around in your world is huge. Um, it's, it does so much for the ambience. So yeah, super important. Now I have a little section here called editor, but the real thing is no, um, because I'm not going to talk about everything that's going to go into the editor because that's just wild. But this is more for some things that you may not have considered such as an undo redo system. Um, the ha proper Hazel doesn't even have this yet, right? Um, I've had it on my to-do list for ages, but I just can't bring myself to do it because it's going to be a lot of work. But basically, the editor needs to be very much aware of every change that ever happens to it. And in this case, how to reverse it, right? Um, that's very important. And that requires a little bit more, um, you know, thinking about how you write code rather than just writing co the bare minimum code to achieve a desired effect, right? So um, that is something that is best done early on. We might actually consider doing this pretty soon for the game engine series. But basically, yeah, that whole undo redo thing 
um, super important. Uh, but the, I think most of it, you you really have to like just look at it as a, as a collection of tools, right? Like, you know, you might in your toolbox, you might have like a hammer, a drill, a screwdriver, all of that stuff. That's what an editor is. It's all these different panels that do different things and they manipulate different data. They come together into this big tool um, called the editor, right? Um, or we call it hazelnut. So uh, th that's kind of what it is. Again, even if we go back all the way to, um, you know, what do we start with? Uh, this kind of stuff, texture atlas stuff, right? If you import a texture that's an atlas, how do you define the cells, right? That's a tool. Um, so there's all these different things that that exist, um, you know, as far as the editor goes, and it's it's hard to even start talking about all the systems. Everything that I've mentioned so far that needs a UI, well, that's gonna be that's gonna be editor stuff. Um, speaking of UI, this is a good transition. Let's go down here. User interface, um, also something that we haven't talked about. Um, I actually had this written down a bit later, but we'll talk about it now. So the main thing with UI is text rendering, right? So you want to be able to render text. This is something we haven't touched at all. Um, text rendering is uh, can be fairly simple, can be fairly complex. You know, choose your poison. Um, it depends on how you want to do it. We want to do it well. So we probably want to use signed distance fields. We don't want to just simply rasterize something from free type into a texture atlas and it's good to go. That is uh, is fine, but it's not gonna get you the nice crisp text that you probably want. So we'll probably look at doing it, you know, using STFs. There's a few good libraries online um, that can kind of generate texture atlases even for us that we can then use as part of that. Um, because there's a lot more to UI rendering than text, of course, uh, layouts, right? So a layout system, I'll say. This, um, I haven't really thought about how exactly I want to do this in Hazel, because there are also libraries that let you, like, for example, define layouts in CSS, and then it will do stuff to it. But like, a good example is, um, I mean, if we look at Hollow Knight, this UI up here, right? So let's but that's a good example of UI. That's something we call a HUD, heads up display. That's just overlaid on our game as we play the game. There's a few things going on here, right? There's actually a lot of things going on here. First of all, the alignment of this. We want it to be in the top left corner, no matter what resolution we're playing at, right? So, I mean, it could be like the screen could be, um, you know, a 4.3 display for some reason. It could be an 18 by 9, like ultra wide monitor, right? And we still want it to be here, right? We want stuff that we've positioned in the middle to be in the middle. That's difficult. You guys who have done CSS know how difficult it is to position something in the middle. I mean, it's probably easier to do like in C++ programmatically, but um, my point is there's a lot of layout stuff that needs to be considered here. Um, but also it's not just the layout of like what stuff gets aligned to, which by the way, could be, you know, set at like 50 pixels or it could be 5%, right? Like you can, you should be able to define these things and change them. But then um, if we look at Hollow Knight again, there's a lot more stuff going on here. Like this uh, kind of soul indicator, those of you who have played Hollow Knight know what I'm talking about. Otherwise this might be um, not that good. You should play the game though. It's it's really, I'm, I'm still playing it. I've just finished Crystal Peak. Um, it's, it's brutal, but it's an excellent game and it's just got such a good vibe to it. Anyway, so this is like the soul indicator. This kind of moves, right? So it's animated. It's, it's also a, this level, it also depends on how much soul you have at the moment. These are basically your lives and these also have to change. Um, they go empty. There are blue ones that you can get right? Like it's, it's very much dynamic and it changes. This is the amount of geo you have. It's like a currency. Um, that also is some text rendering that is positioned in a, in a particular location. And you need to be able to obviously control that value through your metagame through C sharp. So, um, Hollow Knight's made in unity by the way. So, uh, it's a good example of how to lay things out if you're used to unity. Um, but anyway, uh, the point is that a lot goes into this little thing, but then we're not just talking about like the HUD, which is what that is, uh, there's a lot more to UI. I mean, not just hard elements like that stuff, but we also want to obviously support menus and menu screens, all right? So like the pause menu, when the pause menu happens, it happens in the middle. I don't know, I think Hollow Knight does this. I think it it blurs everything out in the background, right? So we need to be able to have a full screen kind of blur that's usually just a UI kind of overlay that blurs whatever's behind it, right? Because UI is usually rendered last. So. 
you know, stuff like that. Um, menu screen, yeah, being able to have a main menu that we can go to options menu with like a slider for like the audio level, you know, all of that UI has to be there. Uh, being able to transition between screens, animations, you know, UI animations, man. Oh, you know, there, <laughs> there's so much stuff. Um, UI is very, very complicated. People who think that UI is easy, I would vouch that it is almost as complicated as 3D rendering. There's so much stuff that goes in it. Yeah, and, and uh, um, an inventory screen, right? So being able to have an inventory uh, where you can like, um, you know, have different items and go through that, like, there's a lot of stuff. I don't, know, I don't, I don't even want to talk about it. It's making me upset. So moving on. Um, so we touched on the editor before I went into this user interface, but also I guess the other important thing is the runtime, right? So we want to be able to, um, this, this is an epic video. We want to be able to uh, basically hit play to play the game, right? Seems uh, simple, but this play button is like a lot of lot of stuff has to happen there. And obviously we need to be able to support it. So um, yeah, being able to basically play Right, but also have a standalone player. So play in editor, but then also standalone. Right, this is very important because if we can't play the game, what are we doing? Um, we need to be able to play the game as a standalone thing. Um, now, realistically, like if we do break down what happens there, usually it will just load a scene. So if you have a menu, it will load the menu scene. If you have a, if you just jump straight into the game, you load the game scene. Um, and you basically play it by starting up like the physics world and then just running the C sharp script. So they have on create functions, then they have on update functions. You just basically run those. Um, and that is your game, right? So it's not that difficult um, in terms of like, uh, you know, what you need to do. You just need to hit play on the physics world basically and then hit play. Um, hit, uh, call the right C-sharp functions. Obviously, there's other engine systems like audio that need to also be potentially initiated um, and initialized, right? But that's kind of for the most part what we expect from a runtime. Now, this isn't about distribution. We'll get to that later um, and about like actually shipping the game. Um, okay, little little blob here, which I might actually put here. Serialization, right? So now when I say serialization, I'm not talking about saving our level. This has nothing to do with the editor. I'm talking about runtime serialization. So what this is, is I want to be able to save my game, right? I don't want the player to lose their progress and start from scratch every time they launch my game. That's obviously very weird uh, for certain games. Um, I want to be able to have a save game, right? So that needs to be like the engine usually will provide a way to do that and uh, possibly even by using C Sharp's reflection system. Um, and then that will actually serialize something on disk, like a file, or it'll go up into the cloud, right? So say games are important, but even for something simple, like you want to be able to have like a high score, right? Even if you make space invaders, I want to be able to um, serialize my high score. So the next time I launch the game, I can see what it is and I can see if I can beat it. So uh, this can all be done. Technically speaking, this can be done outside of the game engine, right? If you have um, if you're using C Sharp, C Sharp has a library. You you can write files. There's no reason why you can't. So uh, that stuff can be done by that, but usually an engine will provide its way of doing this. And that can be a little bit more kind of standardized, I guess. So that's serialization, pretty quick. Um, the other thing is, uh, I don't know if I should even mention this, but cinematics, right? So cutscenes. Right, I want to be able to, and uh, obviously there's nothing to do with 3D, but like I want to be able to, um, you know, I've got my player here. I want to just take the control away from the player and maybe pan this camera over here to show them something. Um, maybe someone comes. There's a bit of dialogue and subtitles, and maybe I want this to be like two, three, five aspect ratio because it's all cinematic. Like, right, like there's there's a lot of like to make this stuff happen. You need to basically create like a a movie maker or some kind of like After Effects style tool. Like you you want to have, you know, various layers that are entities. You want to have a timeline. You want to be able to set keyframes. There's a lot of stuff. I don't know if we'll do this. Like we want to, I want to, but we'll definitely do this for, for proper Hazel. But um, just another thing to do, man. Just another thing to do. Uh, we've done UI. Uh, let's talk about audio. So audio is also immensely important. Um, audio is something people forget about, but more or less people don't know how complicated audio can be. It can be very complicated. At the very base, right, we want to be able to play back audio files. So playback, right? 
I have a WAV file, we'll probably package into like a OG or some other kind of uh, file format. But we have um, we have a WAV file, for example, I want to play it. Um, we need to be able to trigger what are your events. Um, usually this will be set up, there'll be like events actually set up in your scene or in your project. And then you can trigger those and those map to assets and those assets, which are those WAV files, they can have a bunch of parameters on them, such as how loud they are. You know, if they've got any filters or effects on them, that's the other thing. Um, another thing that happens in Celeste, as an example, is when you do go underwater, the sound changes. So as the music is playing and you're underwater, it just gets all kind of muffled. Like it's the high frequency just all cut out. It's like a low pass filter. Um, you know, that's something that you want to be able to do dynamically, right? But also stuff like reverb, delay, you know, maybe, I don't know about EQ and stuff, but, um, you know, you can, having those kind of effects very, I think that, I think it's very important. I think sounds very important. Um, you know, you could do like mixing, um, Mixing, which means basically having different audio channels that you can control the volume of separately. Uh, you could have audio buses where you can send, like, so you have like a reverb bus and everything. Lots of stuff you could do. Um, you know, being able to stream in those assets. So when you're playback, you want to be able to stream them in. Maybe you have a 10 minute ambient sound file. You don't want to decode that whole thing and load it into RAM at once. You might want to just read it off disk, buffer it, and, you know, play what you get. Um, yeah, I mean, you could do a lot of, uh, you could do a lot, like having a node editor for sound, actually our, our, um, sound guy on, on the Hazel team, Jay, he uh, has done an amazing job with audio and Hazel and he's, I mean, this is what he's currently working on. He's working on this like node editor for Hazel's audio system. So that's a great, uh, <laughs> that's a great look at just how far you can push this stuff. You can push all of this extremely far and that's kind of the problem. But anyway, moving on. Uh, so I'll talk about the asset system a little bit, right? So an asset system for a game engine, like the most important thing of an asset system, um, we're not going to talk about like, um, like a virtual file system and other stuff, but like, honestly, it's just to be able to load and unload assets as they're required, right? So I want to be able to not necessarily like, just because I reference an asset or just because I mention an asset, I might not want to load the whole thing immediately. Right, because obviously a game can have many different levels, especially if you're talking about a game like uh, Hollow Knight or a big 2D game. This game's huge, right? There's so many different areas. If and and you have all these textures, you have all these like rather high quality textures, right? These are not things that um, you can just keep all in memory or in your GPU memory all the time. It's just not going to work out. So you need to have a system to load and unload them as they're being used. Um, you know, streaming assets in and memory mapping. So what that means, uh, so streaming, uh, memory map. So what that means is basically, um, instead of like, if you have a, a 500 megabyte texture that you want to get onto the GPU, hypothetically, uh, instead of loading in that whole like 500 megabyte texture to CPU RAM and then loading it to GPU, right? GPU, CPU, you can instead memory map it. So you have like a rolling window, you roll through it, you buffer it. And then that way you never use 500 megabytes of CPU RAM and you can get into the GPU faster because you don't really need it to stick around in the CPU. So memory mapping is very important as well um, for like, you know, something a bit more serious. Uh, and it, it will massively cut down load times as well because you don't need to be um, necessarily loading that whole file. Again, if it is a format that does require the whole file to be loaded, that usually would never exist in a runtime. For the editor, maybe, but again, I'm more thinking about the runtime here. Um, yeah, packaging. Uh, so like maybe creating a binary blob or blobs. Um, we'll talk about packaging a little bit later. So binary blob, but yeah, that also kind of needs to exist. Um, I, another thing that I wrote down was edit a hot reloading. So this is kind of nice. It's a very nice system to have, very easy to set up. Basically, uh, what that means is that when an asset changes, the like a Windows file watcher, for example, will pick that up. It'll be aware that, hey, a file has changed on disk. And you can automatically initiate like a, a reload from that. So an example is I'm editing a PNG file in Photoshop. I hit Control S. Magically, my engine has the updated texture, right? Um, because it's got a file watcher, it's where it's changed and it's re 
reloaded the asset. You might want to be able to turn that off as well, but it's uh, it's definitely very useful to have and iteration times just go through the roof with that. Um, all right, my next step is platform support. So with this, I'm not just talking about like what we need to do, right? To have support for like Windows, Mac and Linux. Right, I would like to support all of these platforms at a minimum eventually, although at the moment we are focusing on Windows. Um, that This is all true, being able to support all this stuff, but um, you also need to be able to support different versions of Windows. So different diff win. <laughs> there are a lot of different versions of Windows. They have different runtimes. They have different like C++. Well, runtime is what I'm, what I'm talking about. You need to be able to support all of this and be sure that the stuff that you're using is widely is as widely available as possible or at least provide alternative paths maybe compile different binaries um for this this falls a little bit into into actual distribution but that's also important right be aware of that but also different hardware so like different gpus so um do you support nvidia uh what about amd what about intel these have these the drivers that kind of, you know, you use here have a big impact potentially. Um, you know, Hazel for the longest time didn't like proper Hazel didn't run on AMD GPUs until I set up an AMD computer behind me with a 6800 XT where I could actually develop for that, right? Um, and that was partially due to me just not like I had some mistakes there that the Nvidia driver was happy with. Um, but technically the Vulcan specification was like, no. Um, but also there were just some things that worked differently that I didn't expect. So um, this is, yeah, it's important to actually make sure that you do support different platforms. And in this section, I've also put things like controllers and game pads, right? So these are like, I guess, human interface devices, right? Like HIDs. Um, these are more like uh, actual, uh, you know, hardware that you would use for input. But they're also very important. Like, um, I I couldn't imagine playing Hollow Knight on a keyboard. I've actually also got the game on Steam, and I played it with a keyboard a little bit. I think I'd probably plug in a controller to play that game because certain games just work really well. Platformers are great. You know, there's no need for precise first-person shooter aiming with the mouse. Um, controllers are great, and uh, you definitely want to support them, especially if, you know, you want to ship maybe on, it, on the Nintendo Switch, and it's not just about Windows, Mac, and Linux. So... Yeah, you also need to be kind of aware of that. And I've put that in here. Is anyone tired yet? I am. Um, networking. <laughs> networking. So networking is an interesting thing because I don't think that we're, like, we're not going to support multiplayer as part of this series, as part of the Game Engine series. Um, Proper Hazel has some plans for that, but we're not going to support multiplayer as part of this series, probably almost overwhelmingly, it's just out of scope, right? This is just too much. But um, by networking, I'm not just referring to like real-time or turn-based multiplayer. I'm talking about just being able to interface with the network, right? So being able to download files, like right? Like being able to download assets, maybe updating the game, even something as simple as having a news screen on the homepage. You open the game and then it's like, news, guess what? Update 1.4 is out. Or like, you know, just being able to communicate with the outside world. Networking, right? Very important. Um, pulling configuration files off the internet. An example is uh, back when I worked at EA, we shipped a game called Need for Speed No Limits, which was a, a mobile game that actually used to pull its tiering settings off of servers that we had. So what that means is that basically we could, we, we had like a database of phones, like an iPhone 6, this was <laughs> back in the day. Um, and we could set like what you know, what shadow resolution should be used for that device? What, you know, what a uh, viewport scale should be used for that device? Um, you know, we could set all this stuff kind of remotely and the phone, when it connected, could download all those configuration settings. That way we could tweak stuff after release. It's a bit different with mobile. I'm not sure what, what how, how difficult it is like on Steam and stuff, but, you know, especially with Apple, it can take a while to be able to push an update, right? And so that's why having your own updating system, your own way to download assets and configuration files is definitely very important. Um, you know, if for nothing else than control of like, uh, of the content that you're actually displaying in your game, you might want to do a special like Christmas or Halloween update or something, right? Um, and you might want to do something special for that basically. So that's important. Um, you could also fit in, you know, if it was mobile, maybe ads, 
but also like uh, analytics, telemetry. We're not going to talk about that. I don't think I want to put any of that into Hazel, at least not for the time being, but that can be useful as well. You can see how many people uh, have crashed their game and why, right? You can send that back to a server. Um, that's quite useful for diagnosing problems. So diagnostics and stuff can be can be used there as well. Um, all right, let's talk about optimization briefly. We're almost done. Are you guys are uh, enjoying, like hopefully now it makes sense maybe while I'm like, maybe let's not do 3D because yeah, I hope this makes sense. Um, optimization. So I like doing this more towards the end because then I know what I'm doing and I'm not going to waste time optimizing stuff that then gets stripped or removed immediately, right? But uh, the biggest change to, um, the biggest the biggest change and the biggest kind of thing, I guess, with optimization is multi threading, right? So making it making the engine multi threaded. At the moment, Hazel uh, Hazel um, game engine Hazel two D. I was like Hazel game engine series. Hazel two D entirely runs on on a single thread, right? There is no threads for literally anything. I as far as far as I'm aware, I don't think so. Um, this is uh, definitely not optimal, right? Because Computers don't just have one core. Uh, computers and most devices have a lot more than one core. What this means is that we can take advantage of that and we can split our workload along different cores. And the thing is, I'm not just talking about like, you know, spinning up a thread uh, to do some work temporarily, like a job thread, right? Like maybe from C Sharp, you want to do some AI simulation and you want that to be multi threaded. Sure, just use the C Sharp API. I'm talking about specifically the engine core itself. So, a very popular model is to have a separate thread, for example, for rendering, right? A separate thread for like physics simulation, separate thread for audio. And that's actually mandatory. But, like, you know, spreading out the workloads a little bit so that you don't have to kind of bottleneck yourself by just having uh, a single thread. So um, as I mentioned with the render thread, that's a very popular model to do. A lot of people think that that doesn't work with OpenGL for some reason, because OpenGL is single threaded. Um, OpenGL has to be entirely, has to entirely exist on one thread, but that doesn't have to be the main thread, right? So you can have your main thread and then that can spin off a, a render thread whose entire job is just to process OpenGL commands, which still have a considerable CPU cost. And you can kind of offload that to a different core. That's a very popular architecture for pretty much every game engine. Um, so that's an example of what we would do um, to kind of uh, basically speed up Hazel a lot. Um, GPU offloading, I also wrote down. So GPU offloading, again, like, I mean, it, it depends what it is. Um, a lot of things you can, a lot of operations you can potentially move to the GPU uh, if you have that. It depends if you're CPU or GPU bound. We're not going to dive into that, but that's just a possibility for optimization. Um, the other thing is you do want to be aware of bottlenecks and slowdowns in your engine. So you need some kind of profiling. Now we have some weird rubbish profiler, I think, in, in Hazel 2D at the moment. Hazel, the proper Hazel, uses uh, something called Optic. We'll probably be using that in Hazel 2D as well. Um, I've actually, like the video that I put out um, recently about uh, diagnosing performance issues in Hazel, that was using optics. If you want to take a look at that and see what it looks like, then that's a pretty recent video. Um, but yeah, so that's also something that um, needs to be done for sure. I think we've, this is it, man. Finally, we are at the end. And the end is basically packaging and distribution. I'm just going to call this distribution. Ah, too tired. There we go, distribution. So how do we ship our game? Um, there's a lot of stuff that potentially has to change for that, right? Um, so how do we distribute it? That. That's that's a question in and of itself, um, but uh, th the biggest change probably is the use of custom formats. So why would you want custom file formats for all of our assets? Basically, is what I'm talking about. So custom formats. So um, there's a few reasons for this. First of all, protection. Right? You don't want to just have all of your assets, all of your art assets, all of the intellectual property potentially that you've built, just be copyable. Right? You also potentially don't want it to be changeable. Like you don't want someone to open your PNG file in Photoshop, draw something on it, and then play your game. That's weird, right? So protection is is a realist is a real thing that you might want. 
um, file size, right? So certain files can be quite large and you might want to compress them. Um, so that's important as well as just speed, right? Most file formats that we use today, PNG, JPEG, that kind of stuff, um, they're not built for game engines. So they can take a little bit of time to decode. Um, also, you may have known, noticed, hopefully, that we use, um, you know, for the editor side of things, for the editor, we use uh, text-based file formats usually. So our scenes are text-based, they're in YAML. Um, a lot of our kind of files are because they're meant for, like, development use. And you don't want to merge binary files together, but for this, you need binary files, right? So switching to binary file formats um, and then trying to optimize for these things is uh, very important. So speaking of which, um, in terms of like speed and stuff, compression, so like things like LZ4, you know, LZ ham, Zlib, I don't remember what else there is. Um, like, right, there's a few others. Um, uh, the, this is useful because you can compress files. Um, I don't think I need to tell you that. It'll make them smaller. Um, and then based on, you know, what which which library you use, basically, you have trade-offs usually between file size and speed. Um, but that's basically um, important. These are all obviously lossless compression libraries. Um, but also, like, not just compression with this stuff, but also GPU texture formats. A lot of people are unaware of this, but um, GPU texture compression. But, like, um, you know, the way that we use textures and the way that we've used textures and most people, I think, who are learning like rendering and stuff use textures is they take their PNG file or whatever, they load it, they get all the raw pixels um, in RGBA, right? Which could be 32 bits each for each channel if it's like in float, if it's an HDR or just, you know, one byte per channel, that's four bytes per pixel. And then they just, just into VRAM, right? And there you go. Now, the problem is that um, if you've actually tried to ever make something substantial and then think about distributing it, you might notice that you very quickly run out of GPU memory, like very quickly, especially if you're working um, maybe on a 3D game that has cube maps and then they have MIPS and then they might be HDR, <laughs> right? I mean, you can easily have textures that are like over half a gigabyte. Um, that's not acceptable. Uh, and again, if we look at all of the stuff that we have here, there's a lot, right? There are a lot of these rather large textures. Now, again, if you have a whole world of that and you want to keep your not just your file sizes down, but VRAM down, right? Then you need to use a GPU texture compression format, um, uh, such as um, I mean, what are the big ones like ASTC, um, ETC, DXT5? Off the top of my head, there's there's others as well. PVRTC I think is for power. PC or whatever, but um, there's like these are these are all compression formats which are pretty cool because it means that you can compress your textures into this format and then you take this binary data that is compressed. You don't decompress it when loading it. You literally put it on into GPU VRAM compressed, and then as it's sampled, as it's used, it re it like it deals with the format basically. So um, that stuff is is awesome. It is lossy usually um, a little bit uh, depends on which settings you use obviously but um, this is very vital I think for this distribution um, so uh, yeah GPU text compression format is very important um, I've written down platforms platform support I guess I covered that but yeah like um, oh right what I meant is like you know if you're shipping on mobile you might want to actually support the platform meaning like um, push notifications which might use the OS API um, if you're shipping on Steam there's like Steamworks and there's like a few Steam has its own APIs for a lot of things like Steam achievements for example you might want to integrate with that so I'll say platform support Oh yeah, this is a big one that I don't know why I put this into distribution because you should probably be thinking about this before that, but localization. Who doesn't like some localization? I don't know if it's spelled with a Z usually, but I'm Australian, so localization with an S it is. I should have spelled a lot of things with an, with an S, but I didn't for you. So, um, but anyway, localization. So um, what this means is uh, basically supporting other languages, right? Um, not just languages, but like localization usually refers to supporting other languages. So again, if you have a main menu, instead of having like play, 
um, and then all the other kind of options, you might want to translate that into Japanese or like Russian or German or any other language, right? So you need support for basically like a database of strings, right? So strings are very important in general for an engine. I didn't put this in because that's boring, but um, and I didn't didn't put in things like uh, actually a big one in optimization would have been memory, meaning. Uh, be aware of the memory you're allocating, maybe have certain like ring buffers or like uh, stack allocators, frame allocators that for memory that lasts just one frame, has a lifetime of one frame. You know, there's a lot of um, stuff that you might want to do with that. But anyway, localization. Yeah, so you have this entire kind of string database where um, you basically, instead of having a string ever in your code base, you have a key um, or you have you request some kind of like ID of a string and then you get back whichever one you need to based on the language settings. So that's important to, to have, right? But um, also this can have deeper kind of implications because like, I mean, not only do you have to make sure that all your fonts support the right glyphs if you are dealing with something like Japanese or Chinese or, I mean, even languages like Russian and German, like, you know, have, German has this like kind of, it's double S is what they write a lot of the times these days for some reason. I don't know, I went to school in Germany, so I know a bit. I also speak Russian. Uh, Russian has a lot of stuff. I mean, umlauts in German as well, but then you have Russian umlauts, you have, um, what's a Russian character that doesn't exist anywhere else? Bear. Um, um, like, <laughs> I, know I thought of that one, but like, there's a lot of different, um, you know, glyphs uh, that you might have to have. It's not just for like Asian languages. Um, uh, a lot of languages obviously have that. And then also um, certain languages like Hebrew and Arabic, you know, they read right to left. So you need to be sure that your alignment is correct and that you're rendering glyphs in the right order, not in this order because you only are aware of the language you speak. So there's a lot of stuff that can happen with localization, but I think that localization is also, I mean, I don't think, um, <laughs> localization is not just about languages and translations. It's also about things like, um, you know, maybe you have uh, your latest kind of save games and they have a date associated with them, a date and a time. So do you write the date like, uh, you know, day, month, year, right? Or do you write it in, I think only America writes month, day, year for, for some reason. Um, but like, uh, I picked something on, MB I was going to pick a value that was like, yeah, 15, because then that way you can tell. But, um, you know, which, how do you write your date based on what region you're in? Because obviously if you've shipped your game to America and they're like eight, eight, oh, it's the dumbest example possible. <laughs> the one case in which it works. But anyway, um, you do something like that. They're like, hang on a minute. It's not even October yet. Um, it's, uh, well, actually, no, in this case, it's August. Man, I'm really failing this, but they might look at this and be like, dude, I did not play this game in October, but you're like, no, you played it on the 10th of August. So it doesn't make sense. Um, so that's important. 24 hour time. I don't know if people, uh, I don't know if this is like necessarily a localization thing. Um, I just like 24 hour time in general. I usually have that on, but I remember in school in Germany, um, you know, we usually wrote time as 24 hour time, but I'm sure that people do use PM there. It's not like the date where everyone writes the date in whatever, you know, region they exist, exist in. Um, and then another thing off the top of my head was like currency and like, uh, you know, delimiters, I guess, for that. So like, if you have a million dollars, right, how do you write the separating thing? And then you have like um, uh, zero cents here, right? So, uh, you know, we kind of in, I think probably most of like, well, America and like a Asia, I guess as well, I'm not 100% sure. We write commas here and then a dot here right? But then, um, you know, European countries, if they were using like euros or whatever, um, you would write dots for these instead of commas. And then you have a comma for this kind of thing. And then you'd put like, I don't know, like the euro symbol, which also, by the way, goes on the end, not at the start. So there, there's all these kinds of uh, localization things that you have to do. Um, and then finally, we have literally like stripping uh, stripping like debug symbols. So do not ship debug symbols and other kind of things that you might want to do. Make sure you compile with actual full optimization. Maybe potentially check out a variety of different compilers to see what gives you the fastest code. Um, but like, you know, stripping uh, symbols and just in general, like production code. So what this means, and production code. So what this means is um, 
uh, not just like um, specifically debug kind of things that should only exist in debug builds or like, you know, like logging, but um, well, not logging doesn't just exist in debug builds, but I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about like any kind of production code that you might use. So for example, maybe you have like a cheat menu that you can pop up to like progress to a level to give yourself a million gold because obviously you're testing the game. All of that should be stripped. Um, anything, there shouldn't be anything to do with the editor, most likely, right? So the editor, editor stuff should just not exist physically in the binary. Um, it shouldn't be accessible. You shouldn't be calling things that shouldn't be called. Um, it, it can be a little bit difficult to separate, uh, you know, your kind of production code, meaning the code you use during the game's production. And then finally, um, what you actually distribute and ship to people. So that's important. Usually code doesn't end up being fully stripped, but at least make sure that you don't have debug symbols so that you can't. So there's harder to reverse engineer everything. Um, and, uh, you know, stuff like debug menus, um, cheat menus, uh, all of that stuff, as well as just unnecessary functions even that might be called for verification. I mean, asserts and verifies should be removed by this point anyway, but you, a lot of the time, that's why C++ is so nice. You can just pre-process pre all of that out and even not compile certain files if you're building in distribution. Anyway, how do I zoom out? Um, this is it, guys. This is uh, this is the plan. Um, I I don't think I've missed anything. What a long video. I hope I hope this is this is fine. I hope you guys made it this far. Um, but like this is as far as I can tell, this is the complete plan. Every not every single one of these things, but most of these things um, will have to make it into. Hazel 2D and into this game engine series project and into proper Hazel as well. So, um, yeah, uh, that is the state of things. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I won't keep you any longer. Um, don't forget to leave a like button. <laughs> don't forget to hit the like button below, please. And, um, patreon.com slash the channel. Best way to help support this. It's a lot of work. Um, it's only possible with your support. And as I mentioned, if you do want to help support the development of proper Hazel, get access to all that source code, um, then uh, your support would be greatly appreciated. It's the only reason why this is possible, right? Um, I would uh, not be doing this more or less full time uh, if it wasn't for you guys. So I'm eternally grateful for that. And I'm also, I'm excited to do all of this stuff, to be honest. And um uh, hopefully you guys are as well. Please leave your thoughts as well in the comment section below. I'm really interested to hear uh, what the response is going to be like to this. I'm a little um, nervous, but to be honest, I feel better after this huge presentation because like it, it, it honestly, like to be blunt, it honestly doesn't even matter what you guys think. Like I, I can't do this if I'm going to do this in 3D as well. And if somehow magically this series is somehow still going on when all of this is done and we've actually shipped stuff and it's stable, then maybe we can look at 3D because I'll run out of things to do with my life, which seems unlikely. But I hope that you understand at the moment, especially for a game engine series, not a 3D graphics programming series, um, this is where I'm at. This is what I need to do. This is the decision I need to make for myself. And, um, and I hope you guys are okay with that. Thank you all for watching. Love you all. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.